In my childhood days, I had the privilege of growing up just across the driveway from one set of my grandparents. They were everyday influences and participants in my life. And I felt privileged and blessed to have their constant presence in my life. My other set of grandparents lived nearly 200 miles away, so it took a little bit more intentional effort for us to interact with them and to have them participate in our lives and for us to participate in theirs. So we had to plan ahead and make sure that we were making the three-hour drive or they were making the three-hour trip at a time that was convenient when we could spend the most time together. But sometimes there would be a variable. There would be the possibility of something unexpected. There was something that might influence the time that we could leave or that they could leave. And in those moments, my grandmother, and let me take a sidebar here. My grandmother was known as Bebo. And I can guarantee you, in the history of human occupancy of this earth, there have been billions of grandmothers there is only one Bebo. <laughs> in those instances in which there might be a variable that would affect departure time or when we weren't quite sure when travel would happen and therefore when arrival would happen, if my grandparents were traveling to our house, she would say, look for us when you see us coming. In the more likely event that we were traveling to their house, she would say, we'll look for you when we see you coming. And I find myself sometimes saying that same thing. If someone has some uncertainty about when they'll arrive, I'll say, we'll look for you when we see you coming. That was one Beboism. On the other side of the coin, if in the unlikely event that we had a surprise, because it took a lot to surprise somebody from three hours away, Bebo's house was not on the way to anything. So we weren't going to just stop by her house when we were on the way to anything else. But if we were within an hour or so and made that side trip to go to see her, in those events when we'd walk into the door, she would say in words that are familiar to some of us, Lord, if I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. <laughs> and you've probably heard that one. But one time, I surprised Bebo alone when I was in college and I made the trip and when I walked in the door, she said something that I only heard her say once in my entire life. She said, JB, because that's what she called me. Jonathan was too long a name. JB, my initials worked though. JB, you caught me with my pants down. <laughs> now, I want to assure you that she was speaking figuratively. She did not, in fact, literally have her pants down, but that was her way. It was another Beboism. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake, or less frequently, you caught me with my pants down. Well, as you know, last Sunday, we began this new worship series in which we're carrying out the, the time span of what we began to celebrate during Holy Week. As Sarah said during our call to worship today, every time we gather together for Holy Communion in this space, we remember those three sentences, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And in Holy Week, almost every single year, in this congregation and in congregations like ours all over the nation, all over the world, we celebrate that Christ has died because we're amazed and we're overwhelmed by the depth of love that Jesus Christ reveals to us in his willingness to lay down his life for us. We celebrate that Christ is risen. Easter Sunday morning, I dare say, is the time that most Christians celebrate than any other time of the year. But then we forget sometimes to share our conviction that Christ will come again. So last week we began this worship series in which we're remembering for ourselves and reminding each other that the greatest comeback, the second coming of Christ, is a reality in which we believe and toward which we work and for which we're preparing. And as we remember that the greatest comeback is something out there in our future together, it's important today to me that we remember it is not the will of Jesus Christ for us to look for him when we see him coming. Nor do I believe that it is the will of any of us or the will of all of us who form the body of Christ together 
that we face Jesus Christ one day and say, if I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. And I believe today's passage reinforces those two ideas in a variety of ways. First, in the three verses that we read at the beginning of the passage, you might have heard some really familiar language. As we shared that passage together in verse 30, I hope you heard that the people will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Last week, when we read from the book of Acts, those two men in dazzling white, the two witnesses, said to the men of Galilee, Jesus' closest followers, this Jesus, whom you saw depart from you into heaven on a cloud, will return in the same way. They were testifying to the truth that Jesus has identified for the first time here in Matthew's gospel and in the other gospels, that he will return in the clouds with power and glory, and we're looking forward to that day. But in the rest of the passage, he starts to describe the quality of his return, how he will return, in what manner he will return. And I hope you heard that in verses 36 through 44, Jesus begins that passage, ends that passage, and in the middle has one more reminder that we simply do not know when he will return. Verse 36 says, About that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. The closing verse, 44, says, You must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected time. And in the middle, in verse 42, we read, Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. The first thing that we hear in this passage is, no one knows. When I was the pastor of First Farragut United Methodist Church, about 10 years ago or so, one of the things that happened that caught me off guard, that caught me by surprise, was when a man walked into my office, put a book down on my desk, and told me that he wanted me to read the book and then invite him back to preach to our congregation about what he had written in the book. And the book contained his precise calculations based on what he had read in the Old and New Testaments of Holy Scripture, and he had calculated the precise day of the return of Jesus Christ. By his calculations, Jesus Christ was returning on April 15th, 2012. If that actually happened, you and I are out of luck. <laughs> because as you heard in today's passage, if Jesus' angels came and chose his elect and gathered them in from all four directions, you and I were not among them. And I say that facetiously because I believe now, as I told the gentleman then, that I appreciated his urgency. He wanted every congregation in the Knoxville area to know that they should be prepared for Jesus' imminent coming. I appreciate that urgency, but I thought there was a little bit of folly and futility to his trying to calculate the exact day. When we've heard from Jesus Christ himself that we cannot know and we do not know. And I believe that Jesus Christ and God the Father are precisely accomplishing what they intend to accomplish in telling us that we just simply cannot know. God knows that there are procrastinators in the world like Jonathan Jonas. I thought it was interesting that my brother in Christ who brought that book in said that Jesus was coming on April 15th. I thought to myself a little sarcastically, that's great to know I won't bother with filing taxes that year at all. <laughs> because I tend to wait if I know there's a deadline. And I think that's part of what Jesus is up to. If we knew the time and if we could calculate the time, people like Jonathan Jonas would wait until close to the time to start to do anything about being prepared for the time. And it's not a game, the second return. But I do think that there's something that you and I can learn about our preparation for Christ's coming by watching some of the games that our children play. Our daughter Josie, who just walked out to uh, kids' own worship, is a pretty bossy child. I waited till she was out of the room to say that. <laughs> and Josie loves to play hide and seek. When grandparents come to visit, that's the thing that she wants to play with them. And Josie's pretty bossy. She'll tell you whether you're hiding or whether you're seeking. And then she'll also tell you what you will count to if you're seeking. But notice the rules of that game. If you go to find a hiding place and you're not quite content with that hiding place, you know how much time you have left 
to change your hiding place because someone is counting to a particular number and you have until that person says, ready or not, here I come, to find the perfect hiding place. So there is an opportunity, if not to procrastinate, at least to make adjustments. But now imagine two other children's games that we've all played or that we've seen our children play. Imagine the difference between hide-and-go-seek and hot potato. You have no idea when the music will stop. And if that potato is in your hand when the music stops, you're the loser. So as soon as the potato hits your hand, you want to pass it along to someone else. The same is true with musical chairs. Have you seen the chaos that happens in musical chairs when there's only one chair left? <laughs> because the music is going to stop at some point, but you have no idea when. So you want to be on the front side of that chair when the music stops. As you're circling around to the back, you kick it into high gear to get back to the front. <laughs> you have no idea. And I think that's the urgency that Jesus seeks to instill into his disciples and church in this passage. Having no idea means that we will be vigilant or it means that we ought to be vigilant. So the tone of this passage tells us that we should start looking before we see him coming and we should always have the cake ready. But there's more within this passage that orients us toward that urgency and that vigilance. Notice that when Jesus describes his coming to his first listeners, the disciples, he tells them to recall the story of Noah from Genesis. And you might recall that in that story, Noah is building this huge ark and populating it with animals and with a very few human beings. And the people around him think that he is crazy. They tease him. They scoff at him. They make fun of him because he is the only one making preparations. They assume that he is preparing for something that will not happen. And Jesus tells his disciples that everyone else is going about everyday life. One of the particular things that Jesus mentions is that they are marrying and being given in marriage. That's a pretty big event in a person's life, isn't it? To marry or to be given in marriage. It's something toward which we make lots of preparations. It may be the biggest event in a person's life. I'll never forget the summer of 1991. My sister was going to be married in August of that year. My parents were public school teachers, and in our home county, that meant that my parents were at home from probably the end of May until the beginning of August. So there's two full months, June and July, that they're at home all day, every day. My sister, the bride-to-be, was in law school, so she was at home from mid-May until sometime at the end of August, so she was at home all day, every day. I was in college, so I was at home from college from mid-May until mid-August. I was at home all day, every day, and the wedding was coming up in August. My dad and I mowed the yard three times a week. <laughs> Anything to get out of that house and the stress and the pressure and the decision-making leading up to that August 10th wedding day. And we've experienced that in our own homes, haven't we? All the things that have to be decided, all the details that have to be perfect. One of the things that I do as a pastor is when a couple comes to me and says, we'd like to begin our premarital counseling, um, I'll say the first piece of advice I have for you is this. If you have bought one of those wedding planning guides that has about six pages of checklist, throw the thing away. You're creating undue stress for yourself by working toward that day. But I'm saying that jokingly because we all know there's joy in that preparation. And it's not just for marriage. We're the kind of people who get joy and a sense of purpose and a sense of, of having something to do as we prepare for all of life's major milestones. If it's not for the wedding, it's for the baptism or it's for the birth of a child. Or it's for that next major milestone in life, the retirement, the graduation. And we tend to be people who are always looking forward to something big. Maybe the vacation that's coming soon. And looking forward to those things, Jesus says, people in the time of Noah ignored what was going on around them. And maybe that's the point that Jesus intends to drum home to his disciples then and to his 